This talk is about the sum of the angles of a triangle, a result that we all learn in school. But when did this result originate, and who proved it? Are there corresponding results for other polygons? And which regular polygons can be used to tile a floor? And are there geometries where this result doesn't hold? The result says that the angles of any triangle in the plane add up to 180 degrees. For example, here are three triangles where this is the case. The first is an equilateral triangle where all of the angles are 60 degrees. The second is a right angle triangle where one angle is 90 degrees and here the others are 60 degrees and 30 degrees. The third is an isosceles triangle where two of the sides and also two of the angles are the same. This one has angles 72 degrees, 72 degrees and 36 degrees. This angle sum result appears in the elements, an important work from the 3rd century BC by Euclid of Alexandria, which was then part of the ancient Greek world that is now in Egypt. Euclid's Elements is the most widely read mathematics book of all time, being used for teaching for over 2,000 years right up to the 20th century. It consists of 13 books, originally written on rolls of papyrus, which contain results from geometry, arithmetic and other areas, and is logically organised. Starting with some definitions, and some basic assumed facts, which we take as a starting point. From these, simple results are proved, and then based on these, some harder ones, then still harder ones until a whole hierarchy of results emerges, with every new result based on earlier ones. On the right, you can see the first English language edition of the elements produced in 1570 by Henry Billingsley, later a Lord Mayor of London. Book one of the elements deals with geometry, the geometry of points and lines, angles, parallel lines and triangles, building eventually to a proof of the Pythagorean theorem for right angled triangles. Euclid starts by defining some basic terms. Those for point and line don't tell us much. But here are his definitions of an angle, as the inclination to one another of two lines which meet, but which don't lie in a straight line. And of parallel lines, which never meet one another, however far we extend them. There are also five so-called postulates, mainly basic constructions that we can carry out, and some assumed logical axioms. We'll return to these later. Here is a result about parallel lines. If a straight line crosses a pair of parallel lines, marked here with arrows, then the two angles marked alpha are called alternate angles and are equal. Also, the two angles marked beta are called corresponding angles and are equal. We'll now use these to prove that the angles of any triangle add up to 180 degrees. This result appears in Book 1 as Proposition 32. Starting with the triangle ABC, we first extend the side BC to a new point D. We next draw a line from C parallel to the line BA to a new point E to give the picture shown here. Now the sloping lines BA and CE are parallel and so the two angles marked alpha are alternate angles and so are equal. Also, the two angles marked beta are corresponding angles, and so are equal. 
Now look at the point C. Here there are angles alpha, beta and gamma and they form a straight line. Now every straight line is 180 degrees. And so alpha plus beta plus gamma is 180 degrees. But the sum of the three angles of the triangle is also alpha plus beta plus gamma. And so is again 180 degrees. And that's the result we wanted to prove. Here's a second proof, credited to the followers of Pythagoras, a couple of centuries before Euclid. Again, we have a triangle ABC. And through the point A at the top, we've drawn a new line DE that is parallel to BC. But because these two lines are parallel, the two angles marked beta are alternate angles and so are equal. And similarly, the two angles marked gamma are alternate angles and so are equal. Now look back at the point A. Here there are angles alpha, beta and gamma. And again they form a straight line of 180 degrees. So alpha plus beta plus gamma equals 180 degrees. But as before, the sum of the three angles of the triangle is also alpha plus beta plus gamma, and so is 180 degrees. This again proves the result. We'll now use this result to investigate some regular polygons, those whose sides and angles are all equal. For an equilateral triangle with its three equal sides, the three interior angles are each 60 degrees. For a square, the four interior angles are each 90 degrees. What are the interior angles of a regular pentagon with its five equal sides? To find out, we split our pentagon into five triangles. Adding up all their angles gives us five lots of 180 degrees. And when we subtract the 360 degrees in the middle, we get 5 times 180 degrees minus 360 degrees, and that's 540 degrees. To find each interior angle, we then divide this by 5 to give 108 degrees. And we can do the same for any regular polygon. If it has n equal sides, then each interior angle turns out to be n minus 2 over n times 180 degrees. So for a regular hexagon with six sides, each interior angle is 4 over 6 times 180 degrees, which is 120 degrees. And below is a table which lists the interior angles for several values of n beginning with the four that we already know. We can use these results to investigate floor tilings made from regular polygons. We're all familiar with tilings of squares, as shown at the top. Here, there are four right angles at each point where tiles meet. And the tiles fit because 90 degrees divides exactly into 360 degrees clearly a necessary condition. Which other internal angles divide exactly into 360 degrees? From our table, we see that the only others are the 60 degrees for equilateral triangles and the 120 degrees for regular hexagons. And you can see the corresponding regular tilings below. All three tilings were known to the ancient Greeks. And around the year AD 300, the Greek mathematician Pappus of Alexandria credited bees for selecting hexagonal arrangements for their honeycombs, because they hold more honey than either of the other two arrangements. Returning to Euclid's elements, we mentioned that Book 1 opened with five basic postulates. 
These say, for example, that we can construct the straight line joining any two points, or that we can extend any line as far as we wish. But while the first four postulates are fairly simple, the fifth one has a very different form. It says, as shown on the left, that if a line crosses two other lines, and if the sum of the angles alpha and beta is less than 180 degrees, then the two lines must eventually meet. This may seem reasonable enough, but for over 2,000 years, generations of mathematicians wondered whether, instead of simply assuming it, as Euclid had done, they could actually prove it from the other four postulates. But no one ever could. However, by assuming this fifth postulate, they could prove other results. One of these was called the parallel postulate shown on the right. It says that if L is a line, and if P is a point that's not on the line L, then there is exactly one line, shown dotted here, that passes through the point P and is parallel to the line L. Another result that can be proved from the fifth postulate is our result on the sum of the angles of a triangle. And in fact, if we assume any of these three results, we can deduce the other two. They can be said to characterize Euclid's style of geometry. But no one could prove any of them directly from the first four postulates. Are there any other types of geometry? How about the geometry of the globe? Here the points and lines lie on the surface of a sphere. And the lines connecting pairs of points are arcs of great circles, such as the equator, as shown here. This is a different type of geometry, in that any triangle formed by three of these great circle lines looks rather like the picture on the right, and its angles add up to more than 180 degrees. And it's not a proper geometry in Euclid's sense either, because it breaks several basic rules. For example, no two of these lines can be parallel. Also, any two great circle lines meet in two points rather than one. And we can no longer extend any line as far as we wish, as required by one of Euclid's postulates. So are there any types of geometry that satisfy the first four of, of Euclid's postulates, but not the fifth? So the basic four hold but we cannot prove the fifth postulate or either of the results we mentioned earlier, such as the angle sum of every triangle being 180 degrees. This question was investigated in 1733 by an Italian mathematician named Sacchere. Now look at these three triangles. If the sum of the angles of every triangle is 180 degrees, then we have the geometry of Euclid that we're all familiar with. For the second possibility, where there are triangles whose angle sum is more than 180 degrees, logical contradictions arose, and Sir Carey deduced that there can be no such geometry. He then hoped to do the same with the third possibility, where there are triangles with angles sum less than 180 degrees. If he had proved that there was no such geometry, then Euclid's geometry would be the only one possible. But he failed to find any logical contradictions in this third case. And it was another 100 years before his attempts were completely undermined, when two people 
independently showed that geometries of the third type do in fact exist. These were Nikolai Lobachevsky of Russia and Janos Boyai of Hungary, who claimed that out of nothing, I have created a strange new universe. What do such geometries look like? They certainly have very strange properties and are difficult to visualize. But in 1880, the French mathematician Henri Poincaré produced his so-called disk model. Here it is. And if it looks slightly familiar, it's because the Dutch artist Maurice Escher based several of his famous circular woodcuts on it. Here, the points of the geometry are all the points lying inside the dotted bounding circle. The lines of the geometry are then of two types. They are either diameters through the center of the circle, two of these can be seen here, or they are circular arcs which meet the bounding circle at right angles, and several of these are also shown. Parallel lines then turn out to be pairs of these lines that meet on the boundary, such as the two near the top right of the disk. In this geometry, there are many triangles, and in all of them, the angles add up to less than 180 degrees. But very strangely, in this geometry, all of these triangles are congruent to one another. And that certainly doesn't happen in Euclidean geometry, where two triangles can be similar, having the same shape, without being congruent, having the same size. But this geometry does do what was required of it. It satisfies all of Euclid's first four postulates, but not the fifth one. It is, in fact, a true non-Euclidean geometry. Thank you for listening.